All right. Let's go. Hi, everyone. My name is Russell, and today we're going to be talking about PCI. So that includes PCI devices, PCI slots, uh, protocols, versions of protocols, and how we go from hardware to something that your code can actually use. So on screen, you can see this is a PCI device. It is a uh, wireless, like a Wi-Fi device. I own it. It's not particularly good. So a brief bit about me. I'm actually a UQ graduate. I graduated a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science in 2014 uh, before moving to Canberra, where I'm a full-time Linux kernel hacker. And my main job is making sure that PCI works properly in Linux on the power architecture. And a little bit about Canberra. Canberra's not that bad. If you're exploring grad opportunities and Canberra comes up, don't just be like, ooh, Canberra. It's not, it's not that bad. It's just cold. So what exactly is PCI? PCI stands for Peripheral Component Interconnect. And I had to embarrassingly admit that when I submitted this talk to CompCon, I didn't know that, because no one cares. It doesn't matter what it stands for. It's just PCI. Everyone calls it PCI. And PCI is a standardized interface for plugging stuff into computers. So PCI is much more closely integrated to the rest of your computer. It's closely integrated to memory. It's closely integrated to the processor compared to something like USB. PCI is for low-level um, peripherals and stuff like that. Think a network card, think a GPU, rather than like a USB thumb drive. And PCI is an integral part of all laptops, desktops, and servers. Whether you know it or not, you use PCI devices all the time. In laptops, it's sort of a different form factor. It's mini PCI, but that doesn't really matter. In desktops and servers, there's PCI everywhere, both in um, cards that you can plug into a slot and also built onto the motherboard itself. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And if you've ever heard of PCI compliance, this has nothing to do with that. PCI compliance has something to do with like credit cards or something. If anyone ever mentions PCI compliance, just buy them a beer because their life probably sucks. <laughs> so just so we're clear what we're talking about, this is a motherboard. It's got some PCI slots on it. So you can see there's two down the bottom. You have two conventional PCI slots. That's old stuff that isn't very good. And then at the top, you have two PCIe, two PCI Express slots. The one at the top is, has one lane and the one Below it has 16 lanes. And this width, this variability in how fast and how much power it uses is one thing that led PCI Express to be very successful. And we'll talk about that. So a brief bit of history about PCI. Basically, before this timeline, everything sucked. There wasn't a standard bus for peripherals. So obviously, that needed to change in 1992. PCI 1.0 was a thing. Um, it didn't really catch on until about 1994, when it started to get shipped with pretty much every computer. But pretty quickly, um, it became obvious that PCI had some problems. Uh, and we'll talk about what those problems are. But in 1997, AGP, which I think is Advanced Graphics Port, came out, which was kind of like a hot-fixed version of PCI to solve some problems that graphics cards were having. Then in 1998, PCI-X was sort of similar, but mostly aimed at the server market, had a couple improvements, but didn't really fix the fundamental problems that PCI had. Then later, PCI Express came out in 2004 which was the saving grace. PCIe is great, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and since then, there's been uh, revisions of PCI Express, so they're mostly just performance improvements, uh, pretty damn significant performance improvements as well. And the next one is expected next year. So a brief overview of how the hardware works for conventional PCI, so that's PCI 1.0, not PCI Express. It kind of looks like this. And you obviously don't need to understand everything that's going on here. But the important part is that up the top, we have the processor and the north bridge. And the north bridge is kind of just the stuff that's really tightly integrated with the processor itself. So think memory. The south bridge isn't like that. It's got more peripherals that don't need to be tightly interacted, uh, interactive with the processor. For example, serial ports, mice, keyboards, floppy drives, that kind of thing. And through the middle, that big line through the middle is the PCI bus. The PCI bus is a 33 megahertz shared bus. So first of all, 33 megahertz, not a lot. And second, shared. That means everything on that bus has a maximum performance of 33 megahertz between them. Imagine if you're playing a game, you have a gaming computer, it's got a network device, and it's got a graphics card. And you're having a great time, 144 frames per second, rock solid. And all of a sudden, the program in the background starts downloading. So now your network card is going through a bunch of packets. Imagine if you lost frames in your game because your GPU can't use as much resources because now your network is doing stuff. This is the suffering that people had to live under with conventional PCI. 
On the right, you can see there are four PCI slots in this diagram, and also connected to this bus are an onboard Ethernet controller and a SCSI controller. So the Ethernet and SCSI won't be in a slot. They will be built onto the motherboard itself. PCI, the PCI bus isn't necessarily used only by expansion slots. It's also used by things on the motherboard. So let's say you had a Broadcom network adapter built onto your motherboard, and you also had a Broadcom expansion PCI device, the exact same driver would handle those in the operating system. Those are treated in software as pretty much the same thing, even though one you can remove and one you can't. So there are some issues here, and as I mentioned, the biggest one is that it's a shared bus, and shared buses are really slow. Um, because, of the, because you have a shared bus, you are pretty limited to the amount of devices that you can have and then have them actually function correctly. There are also some pretty big inefficiencies in interrupt handling. When the CPU receives an interrupt over PCI, it has to then spend a bunch of time figuring out where exactly it came from. Later in PCI's lifetime, uh, they did make some faster buses, think like 66 megahertz, but these were even further limited in terms of how many devices you could have on them. And then PCI-X and AGP were kind of band-aids, but didn't fix the real problems until PCIe. So PCIe came out and solved a bunch of problems. I like to think of PCI Express as just, what if PCI didn't suck? This is what it is. Um, it was backwards compatible, which is a very big deal if you want to get market share. Um, it, was a ser it was a serial instead of a parallel bus, which I won't go into, but basically it solved a lot more problems than it created. One of the problems was uh, that the traditional PCI had a common clock, and so timings could be thrown off when multiple devices are doing things. It's no longer a shared bus, which is terrific. Your um, PCI Express device's performance will not be impacted by what anything else is doing. It's got that flexible link width. So I talked about that when I showed you the slots on the motherboard. You saw a 1x and a 16x width slot. And this means that for something that's really high performance, like a graphics card, you can give it all the power you possibly can, and it'll use it all. But for something that doesn't need that much performance, maybe just like a Wi-Fi card or something, it can go in a 1x slot or a 2x slot. And what this means is that it doesn't use anywhere near as much power, and that materials are also a lot cheaper to actually make the things. So you can re this flexibility really allowed PCI Express to take off, because it, it made, made it that it was suitable for a wide variety of peripherals. And another thing is that because it's now um, more point-to-point -point than a shared bus, um, a lot of efficiency was gained by not having to figure out which packets go where. So this is kind of a high-level overview of what the hardware for PCI Express looks like. Um, now, the big red thing in the middle, the root complex, the root complex isn't actually defined to be anything in particular. It's kind of just a high-level abstraction for um, what your CPU goes through to talk to other things on the motherboard. So memory, for example, or PCI stuff. And attached to the root complex are a number of PCIe endpoints. So PCI Express can be behind switches, so it's just like a, any kind of standard um, switch multiplexing you're used to. It means that you have performance limitations by how much you can put through the switch, but it also allows you to have a lot more things attached. So we have a switch with some PCI Express endpoints. On this diagram, it's called legacy endpoint. Legacy, think as before, like um, PS2 keyboards, serial ports, that type of stuff. We've got in the middle a directly attached PCI Express endpoint. And on the right, we have a bridge that goes to traditional PCI. So you could still have that same 33 megahertz shared bus on your motherboard and use it with a modern PCI Express architecture if you really wanted to. So that's kind of a very high level overview of how the hardware works. What happens when you turn your computer on? How does everything, how does the plumbing work? Well, first, the first thing we need to do is figure out where stuff is on the system. What's plugged into where? Are there any switches? So the way we do this is that firmware will read from everything. It'll go, okay, for every endpoint that we have, let's see what's there. It'll look for a number of things. It'll look for um, the vendor of the PCI device, um, usually what device it is, whether or not it's a switch, stuff like that. If it gets all ones back, so OX, F, 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 then that means there's nothing there. So endpoints return what exactly they are, and if it's a bridge, the process continues. So if we were go to go through sort of in order how this would work, it's kind of a uh, depth first search. So the first thing we see is the switch on the left that gets labeled as one, 
Um, the bus within the switch that does the multiplexing gets labeled as two. We then go through everything attached to the switch, then back to the PCI Express endpoint in the middle for number six, and then the bridge on the right for number seven. So it's pretty simple, really. This is just how the system will go through, looking at what it's got attached, and figure out where everything is. So a little bit more on the identifiers. On the left, we have the graphics card I own, and on the right, we have the graphics card I want. And you can see the numbers below them. The GTX 770 has an identifier of 10DE1184, and the graphics card on the right has a identifier of 10DE1B80. So you can see that the number on the left is the same, because this is the vendor ID. 10DE means NVIDIA somehow, right? So I think an NVIDIA driver will look for that when it's trying to figure out what, drive, uh, what device to touch. And the number on the right is assigned to the individual device. So in this case, 1184 represents a 770, and 1B80 represents a 1080. So this is how we figure out wh what device is what. The device itself just gives you these values, and it's up to the firmware or operating system to figure out what we do with these devices. So when we access PCI devices, there's multiple different address spaces that tell us different stuff. Um, and the only two that really matter are configuration space, or config space, and memory space. So config space is standardized. Uh, PCI devices have to put stuff in config space, and there has to be certain stuff in certain memory locations. Think things like the vendor ID, that's in configuration space. And memory space is where all the data is, basically. So this is how PCI config space is defined. The only things you need to take away from this is at the top. Um, vendor ID and device ID. These are defined in configuration space. You're going to be able to read these values out of any PCI device. There's also some other interesting stuff in here. Um, so the base address registers will tell you where exactly to look for the other parts of the device. Um, it's got a capability pointer, which will point you to another region in config space that has capabilities, which I'll talk about in a second, and other bits and pieces, subsystems, latency, stuff like that. So just to briefly touch on capabilities, in configuration space, a PCI device defines a bunch of capabilities that are kind of just generic, saying, I support this, I don't support this. So for the inbuilt graphics um, on my laptop, this is what it said its capabilities were. We've got MSI, which is interrupt stuff, supports some stuff. It's got power management version 2, which I assume is way better than power management version 1, and PCI advanced features, whatever that means. But the point is, these are the type of capabilities that the device will report. And it means that an operating system can say, oh, well, this thing's got power management version 2. We'll do this. We won't do this. It's more, a more generic thing. These aren't really aimed at um, changing the function of a specific driver. It's more changing how an entire system would interact with these devices generically. So memory space, aka where all your stuff is. Um, there are two different ways that we access memory space from a processor. There is MMIO and DMA, and we'll get into those in a second. Um, just going to briefly touch on virtual memory, if you don't know what virtual memory is. So when we talk about memory accesses on a processor in your operating system, when you access a memory address, it's not necessarily RAM. It could be other stuff. It could be your disk could be mapped in there, PCI stuff could be mapped in there. There could be nothing in there. The important thing to note is that when we talk about accessing a memory address, it doesn't necessarily mean RAM. It could be other stuff. And we're going to talk about putting PCI stuff in there with MMIO, memory mapped I.O. So what we do is we map parts of the PCI address space into virtual memory on the processor. And because of this, the way you access PCI stuff is now very similar to accessing any other kind of memory on your system. You're using the same types of accesses, the same like CPU instructions to do it. And this is sort of the standard way you would interact with a PCI device, particularly if it doesn't need to be performant. It's simple, it's easy to set up, it makes sense. This is used by literally every PCI device. The issue is that it's slow, and it's slow because the CPU has to do everything. If you're transferring, let's say it's a graphics card, and you're transferring a picture of a cat from disk to your device, that means you have to load it from the disk into RAM, then probably from the RAM to the, to the graphics card, and the CPU is doing every part of that transaction. And there's a way to work around this, and that's called DMA. So DMA stands for direct memory access, and this does some magic to allow your PCI device to directly access system memory 
without the CPU really doing anything other than initiating it. This heavily negates the bottleneck of the CPU. Um, if the CPU, if you're playing video games and the CPU is copying every single texture over, you're going to be hugely bottlenecked on the CPU rather than the graphics card. DMAs allow the graphics card to go straight to memory and do all this stuff without the CPU being a part of it. So the CPU can be free to do other things. And this gets handled by a DMA controller. So the CPU will typically initiate this, then it'll go do other stuff. And there's a DMA controller on the chip somewhere which will sort of initiate the transaction and then usually let the CPU know somehow when it's completed or if it's failed or something like that. So back to firmware. So we've gone through um, how we enumerate what's on our system. We've gone through how we talk to the things that we end up finding. How exactly does it all fit together when you turn on your system? Well, once firmware's figured everything out, it needs to put it in a format that the operating system can understand. And this needs to be done in a somewhat generic way because you don't know what operating system you're going to be running. And the format this gets put in is typically dependent on architecture. x86 systems usually use ACPI or UEFI. Um, many other architectures use what's called device tree, which is becoming more of a standard. Uh, it's heavily used on both ARM and power. And so this is an example of how things get encoded into device tree. And this doesn't need to be specifically device tree. It could be one of those other formats, but... This is what firmware will pass along to the operating system, so the oper operating system knows where stuff is. So at the top, we've, we've got a PCI node. It's at a certain address. It says stuff like, hey, I'm an ARM versatile PCI host bridge, and the operating system will know what that means. It defines stuff about interrupts, like address stuff, ranges. So this is the type of thing that firmware will pass along to the operating system. So let's talk about the operating system. Uh, the OS. Um, the OS will first do a whole bunch of, it'll map things, it'll configure things based on what it's seen. It will sort of go over that whole device tree, populate its own data structures with everything it's found, and then do whatever configuration it needs to do before it's at the point where it can hand over to a driver. So the operating system will then figure out which driver to attach to a certain device based on a few attributes. So on the left, we have a graphics card again because I really like graphics cards. Um, this is an AMD R9390. It's got a vendor ID of 1002 and a device ID of 67B0. So on the right, we have some code in the AMD GPU Linux kernel driver that looks for this specific card. So inside a um, PCI device ID struct, we have an entry to this, this array that looks for this specific device. So if you see the top line, it's looking for 1002 and 67B0. So it's saying to Linux, if you find a device with, these specific, um, if it, with this specific identifier, I want to attach to it. It's saying that it will match to any subsystem. It doesn't care about class, and it refers to the fact that the chip inside this graphics card is called Hawaii for some reason. So this is how a driver in Linux will say, this is the type of device I want. Please let me take ownership of it. Drivers. So PCI dr drivers, once they have ownership of what they want to take ownership of, they then have to configure the device to get it ready for prime time, ready to actually be used. Um, so depending on the type of driver, the type of interface that it has to set up are different. So if it's a network interface, um, the driver needs to configure it to the point where it's ready to receive packets on a certain address. It's the driver's responsibility to handle stuff like power management. Like, so for example, if um, the device isn't really being used or it's not being used much and it supports like a low power mode. It's, it's up to the driver to be able to do that. If there's um, error handling that needs to take place, that's typically done inside the driver. And um, the last thing I want to talk about is that just because, these are, just because we're talking about PCI drivers, different drivers look very, very different. Um, any kind of network driver is going to be very different to any graphics driver. The type of interfaces they have to deal with are different. The type of things they support are different. The end game of what it looks like when it all finally works is very different. So how exactly do you use these devices from user space? We've gone through. We now know kind of what the hardware looks like. We know how things get plugged together when we turn on our system. How do we use these devices from user space? So user space code can't directly perform an MMIO or a DMA. It doesn't have any mechanism to do that. Sort of. It does, but you should absolutely never do it in any practical case. 
very much a, a developer. Like, if you're working on a specific PCI device and you want to rapidly get feedback from it, then you probably can, but you shouldn't do that. So you're not going to be directly performing operations on the device. Typically, you're going to be going through some library or some interface that the operating system or driver has designed for you to use this. So common examples, as before, if you've got a network card that's configured to listen on a certain interface that, and you create a socket that does stuff on that interface, you're now using that PCI device. All of that, all of the hardware, all of the driver, all of the driver work, that's abstracted away from you. It's just going to work. Similarly, if you've got a GPU and a graphics driver, it's going to know how to translate OpenGL calls that you use in your game or your visualization and translate that into actually putting stuff on your screen. So here's a quick example of how knowing just a little bit about this stuff can be useful. And this is from the OpenGL API. And that might be a little bit hard to see, but the idea is that the top example, we are using um, a ARB vertex buffer object, which contains texture graphics-y stuff. And what happens in the diagram is that we have a texture source, the CPU puts it into RAM, and then the CPU has to initiate a transfer from that to the GPU. So it requires CPU cycles to transfer this to the GPU. On the lower example, we have things like um, an ARB pixel buffer object, or PBO, and the way this is implemented under the hood is that it's designed to use asynchronous DMA. So what happens is we move the texture directly into OpenGL controlled memory. So this is a region that is set up to do DMA that the graphics card is aware of the context around it. So what happens is we place this texture in there and now the CPU is done. It's not on the GPU yet, but the CPU is free to do other things. So it's now up to the DMA controller to transfer that from memory to the GPU. So the CPU is freed. And the important thing here is that because um, both the driver um, and the graphics card are very aware of OpenGL and are aware of the context in which things are being executed, they can choose to delay this process until the texture is actually ready to be drawn. So this becomes like an asynchronous event. Um, think of like a future or something like that. It can be dynamically, um, like the GPU can dynamically choose to go and fetch this texture when it knows it's about to draw it, saving a whole bunch of time and improving performance. So that's it, that's PCI. Um, thanks, and let me know if you have any questions. Any questions? EH stands for PCI Enhanced IO Error Handling. Yes. Um, that each lane is a bi-directional, so one up, one down, serial interface, I believe. They should all be saturated, yeah. I'm not sure. That's probably dependent on um, the API itself and how much it knows the context of what's going on. I'm not 100% sure how that would work in every situation. Okay. Yes, um, in PCI Express they can. Yes, that's called peer-to-peer. -peer. That is a thing. There's also some other types of peer-to-peer. -peer. For example, if you've heard of um, SLI or Crossfire for graphics cards that can Basically, the way those work is that um, they look as if they're a single one, but they have the ca capacity of two because they work together. Uh, PCI devices can talk peer-to-peer. -peer. Yep. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>